Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Najat. It's very nice to be back at the Said Business School. And uh, I'm going to take about 20 minutes. It'll be a holistic, fast-moving uh, tour, I think, of uh, policy and social issues. And for all budding entrepreneurs in the room, I just have uh, one big message, which is think ahead, think about both policy and society when planning your own personal business. Uh, when I've given this short talk before, I've challenged the audience to come up with business ideas. And at ANSIAD uh, last year, I had more than 45 business suggestions. They're yours, so please keep them to yourself. But if you want to share them with me, you can, you can do that. Uh, this is um, for the summer 2017. I do also publish a little bit of policy, uh, which I hope will be of interest. It's both for the um, emerging markets and the developed markets. And it's on the website. You can sign up to the policy and you get a newsletter once a month, which is very short. Um, and that's the, the Twitter uh, handle. I tweeted something this morning about uh, education and Saeed on that, on that uh, uh, Twitter account. So Time Partners, my company, uh, it, we advise private equity and venture capital. We help governments as well worldwide with social policy. I do interfere a lot uh, in politics. Um, I have very strong opinions. Uh, I was pro-Remain, and I've been working actively in the past few months to try and give advice. Some of it is listened to. I can point out that the Conservative Manifesto published a few weeks ago, not a single idea of mine was included. So I'm extremely <laughs> proud of that. Um, this is my career, very briefly. So I'm 58, and uh, as His Excellency said earlier, you really have to think back when you get older to see what uh, path you followed and what you chose to pursue. I chose to pursue a business path, but about 20 years ago, I felt that I wanted to be involved a little bit in society's issues and in politics as well. So I've tried to run not just a double life, but a triple life. It's all Jekyll and Hyde and something else on top. So my most enjoyable experience has been in the not-for-profit sector. I was on the board of the BBC until a few weeks ago, and I'm extremely proud that when you look at the new BBC annual report to be published in two weeks, please look at the first few pages. The BBC has no profit. It only has purpose. It has five public purposes which earn it the right to gather £3.5 billion a year from the British licence fee payer. Have you ever seen a report on how they have met their purposes? No. But in two weeks, you'll see it for the first time. So what I try and do is get involved in businesses that irritate me, and I try and reform them. <laughs> and uh, I hope I've been quite successful. I, I'm going to go very, very quickly. The full length of this is about 50 minutes, so I'm going to do it in 20 minutes. So you'll have to excuse me, I'll just touch on every slide in a few seconds. There's a lot more data and information behind it. If you want, you can contact me later on. The big mega trends I look at, now this is relevant everything to entrepreneurship, because when you're thinking about a business, think about where is the world going. You need to have a view on many things and then pick one thing to pursue. I've always started in 1990, and I look forward to 2040 here, and I've tried to compare what's happened in the past and where we are in this trajectory. And the big issue here is that by 2040, the states of the world will truly understand and appreciate the power of business. Uh, the big global trends that I look at are these five. Uh, the most important to me is demographics. Never forget demographics. If our politicians in Europe understood the demographics of the next 25 years, they would have a completely different view on migration. The natural population of the United States is about 750 million. They're at 325 million. They need people desperately, but the birth rates are falling across northern US. Europe I'll come back to in a moment. So these are the big five I look at. Demographics. So this is the most important uh, chart of the day. This is 100 years from 1950 to 2050. You'll see that the birth rate is now 2.5 globally. So the speed with which that birth rate is falling is somewhat exponential. You could look at the latest UN publication, if you, if you wish, uh, three weeks ago, and read it cover to cover. It'll take you 25 minutes. 
it's complete rubbish. What it says is that they're extrapolating on current birth rates on an equal exponential rate at 2.5 today, balanced across every country, and they predict that Nigeria will be the third biggest country in the world by people by 2050. That's not correct. It's not correct because what they admit openly that they're not absorbing is the way in which behavior is changing. If you look at Masindi, northern Uganda, by Lake Albert, where I build schools, we have 110,000 families. The birth rate has fallen from six to two in 12 years. And that's because of one thing, and that's each headmaster in each school has a mobile telephone. The information and the understanding and the knowledge sharing, even amongst the poorest people in the world, is now very quickly changing patterns of behavior. You'll notice that at 2.5, if we carry on at exactly that rate, we get to, according to the UN, 11.2 billion. I think it'll be 9.5. They also helpfully say that if 2.5 drops to 2 or goes up to 3, the result by 2050 will be between 8.5 and 16.5 billion people. This is extremely important. This is extremely important in terms of business planning, geography, industry choice. This slide alone created 14 business ideas from the ANSIAD Business School last year. Uh, so I believe that the population tree is moving like this. It's currently shaped like that globally. And this is contracting at the bottom. It's expanding at the top, which means a bulge is moving through the center. So people aged between 20 and 45 you'll see that age group expanding like a big, fat American belly at Disneyland <laughs> over the next 20 years. Those are the millions of new people who possibly will not have work or meaning or good jobs. That's a giant political and social issue. Uh, under 30s, mostly in the developing world, in the red. The old world is North America, Europe, Japan, and Australasia. So the future is yours, but only 50% um, of our growth is in those nine countries. So we're heavily banned, but they're changing extremely rapidly. If you look at behavior in Lagos and Abuja, the most educated, it's dropping very quickly, which is why the predictions on some countries are not right. Uh, old Europe, of course, we, where we have a problem, our birth rate has dropped uh, massively, and by 2050, for every 100 workers, you'll be supporting 50 older people. It hasn't happened in human history. It's technically impossible. Um, and Japan, that's Japan in 2025. If you can see the bottom, the Japanese health ministry predict 51 min million people by 2115. So they've proposed that Japan accepts 40 million migrants in the next 20 years. And if they don't, the shape of that economy will change enormously. So you might think, why is this relevant to entrepreneurship? It's extremely relevant if you think you're going to sell your product in Japan. We bought Toomey when I was at Doughty Hans in the luggage business in New Jersey. Our strategy for Japan was different because of the aging population. Our bags are more conservative in Japan. So for every entrepreneur, think far ahead about patterns, pace, change. The future age tree is going to look something like this by about 2090, a large number of old people, a small number of young people. This used to be a pyramid. If you imagine the pyramids of Cairo, this is what it did look like for 10,500 years until 1950. This is what it looked like in 2100, which means we have a shortage of traditional labor, ultimately, but not yet. There's going to be a great big bulge coming through in the future. So I'm going to look very quickly at industry. This, I think this clicker just went off. Oh, your battery is very low, it says here. 7%. So that must be... I've closed that sign. Okay, we've got 7% we've got battery. So these are the big five industrial trends that I, I follow, and I'd encourage you to understand these. Uh, what we're looking at, of course, is the introduction of technology in business after business. 
And I regard 20, uh, 2007 as the key year of change. The world's biggest companies today were all founded in 2007. And from about 1900 to about 2000, this is how we made cars and um, toothbrushes and anything else you want. On the left, that's traditional manufacturing. On the right is how businesses will work in the future. This is known as post-lean thinking. And we work very closely with Frode Odegaard in Silicon Valley, with the private equity community across Europe on introducing this type of thinking in how to run companies. The most important words on this, to me, in all the businesses I've developed, are the bottom three red words, love your alumni. These are networks, these are systems that will come back. After starting Eight Miles, the private equity group in Africa, I built an Eight Miles alumni straight away, even before anyone had left. So I had a sort of pre-alumni alumni. They're the most important people to me across Africa and have helped with a lot of good policy ideas. So there are three giant issues that are facing you if you have the post-lean thinking in your head. And these you must remember to combine with demographics and other issues. So this is just a touch on industry. Jobs, I'll let you read this. Firms, this is how companies will behave and think. So you're starting your own firm. Whatever you do, keep awake, remain agile, and think ahead. Use your alumni, because the number of businesses that will fall and rise each year are dramatic. But worse to come, industries. Pick your industry, because no industry will remain constant. Everything is changing. I think many of us now know that many industries that we think will be there forever will really not. Banking, insurance. OK, I guess we've lost our battery. So we better... Uh, is it the laptop, do you think, Najat? We'll take a, a quick uh, break while we <laughs> fix the technology. That just went off. It's plugged in. Uh, industry, so back, so, yeah, bank, the b b industries under threat would, of course, include banking, uh, insurance, anything that can be disrupted, especially anything that uses large quantities of real estate or contacting consumers or people in different ways. So I'd be quite cautious. I've just started a new merchant bank. Um, just to let you know, everyone who's working with me, uh, their notice periods are very short. We're very agile. We have a large number of special advisors. We effectively mobilize about 25 specialists at a time, but I only employ five people. And I hope that's a model for the future. It's not great for everyone who works, but this is a symbol of the world that is coming. And if I was 25, I would assume I'm going to have about five jobs in my life. And therefore, I need multiple skills. If you remember the picture of the Empire State Building is said at the bottom, keep skilled, keep learning. And that's especially important for the older generation, 60 to 90. Remember our pension age was introduced, copying Bismarck, age of 60, 65, when life expectancy was 67. Work to 65, two years off, die. Now work to 65, 40 years off. Who's paying for that? The state can't pay, which means you have to be prepared to look after yourself or engage with business. So business, this is the third high level, demographics, industry, business. So this is what has happened in business. It, we're about 20% into this, and I'd say we'd be about 90% in in about 30 to 40 years. The customer is now a stakeholder. 
you don't sell to somebody, you engage with them. And I think you all know this, and there are hundreds of examples of this. But what it means in terms of how you behave as a business is that you have to think now of two giant pools of interest. The first interest is the capital. If you're in private equity, you produce an internal rate of return, and you report that and then return capital with profit to your investors. We have been thinking like this for hundreds of years. Uh, from about 10, 15 years ago, we realized that we had a significant impact on society and the economy. There is an overweight towards impact on society, an overweight in the sense that when I started 8 Miles, I worked with the World Bank on measuring impact. So they wanted to invest in 8 Miles, the IFC, Eventually, they put in $50 million, but they said, I must adhere to the Social and Environmental Management System, SEMS, and SEMS was attached as Appendix 1 to our fund documents. And I took the risk, supported by my partner, Bob Geldof, in saying to the World Bank, we will not do this, we refuse to do this, because what you're measuring is potential negative social behavior by any of our companies. What we intend to measure instead is positive economic and negative economic impact along with social because you're underappreciating the positive impact of what we do as a business. So we develop the external rate of return. And the external rate of return is a measure that measures 25 to 30 outputs from business activity. Taxes generated for your government, taxes generated locally, Jobs, secondary jobs, skills, intellectual property. Have you ever seen a private equity fund in Africa measuring intellectual property and reporting on that? No, because nobody wants to hear that. They only want to hear the negative, the negative potential of what you're doing. So uh, you know ESG and CSR. You have to report on that in your businesses. These are negative control systems, and they underappreciate the full extent of business. So the five areas are these five. In a business that you're planning today, I would measure your impact on all five. They can be negative and they can be positive, and you can measure them in a, in a metric. And if you look at the... Um, I'm just going to wait. So I'm sorry, I can hear you all the time. So... Uh, if you just uh, look at my website, the external rate of return, it was published with the London School of Economics a few years ago, and we provide a measurement system so that you can measure and report your positive and negative impact. And if you show this to your investors, they will really appreciate this. You're more honest, you'll attract more capital. So an example is Leon, the coffee shop, versus Starbucks. So Starbucks, as a young person, is walking towards the two shops in the morning to get a cup of coffee. Leon is an example of showing the benefits of all of this, the, the ERR. They think about their customers, the people around them and their community, their supply chain, their workers, and they explain everything that they're doing in their product and their service. They explain how many taxes they're paying and how many skills they're building and secondary jobs created and uh, Starbucks don't. And if you're under 30, you're moving towards these two choices. You'll probably now tend left. So if you as a business invest in this type of reporting and this type of integrity, your profits will grow as well. So many people in venture capital think that the ERR is a, is a negative drag on your profit. I believe quite the opposite, and that more capital will flow towards this. You can see it across now the private equity industry. So in terms of, so I've covered demographics, industry, and business, and what does this mean for policymakers across the world? I think we should think in to, in, across these laterals. So I put my career into, into politics and policy, business, and the not-for-profit sector. And I'm arguing with politicians to provide frameworks to allow entrepreneurs and businesses to develop in clever system thinking. System thinking means thinking out of the box. Don't be narrow. Don't hide. Today in Britain, we have these three groups. 
We have the politicians, the policy makers, the think tanks, the lobbyists, and the spads, supported generally by the media. Politicians think they, they know a great deal. They know less than they think. They're always looking for someone to blame. Normally, we in business in Britain are the guilty parties. Business, businessmen generally don't understand policy and politics. Unlike the French system, the British system is a little backward in that regard. And we tend to try and throw in, through lobbyists, our business ideas. The not-for-profit sector always feels vulnerable and underappreciated. An example of teamwork is the first one. The Human Trafficking and Modern Day Slavery Act was developed by the Centre for Social Justice, where I was chairman for many years, a think tank in Britain. And we took a survey to see if modern day slavery still existed. And most of those that we spoke to said, no, it was abolished um, 150 years ago. We discovered after one year's basic research across the world using many of our charities and other systems that we calculated about 35 million people were in slavery, including 22,000 in Britain. We developed the Modern Day Slavery Act by putting forward a piece of paper, which was 10 pages long, to the Home Secretary and Frank Field in the Labour Party. We got Theresa May and Frank Field together to host sessions of listening in our not-for-profit think tank. And we invited business people, including Richard Branson, the co-op, and other business leaders, to th say whether they knew if or cared whether modern-day slavery existed in their supply chains. We provided examples from private equity to me, the business I mentioned earlier, where we invested in closing factories, re-educating people, and helping the children out of manufacturing to me bags in China. To, uh, Doughty Hansen spent $25 million on that. At the, at the time we did it, we were criticized by our colleagues saying, can we afford to spend so much money on eliminating that part of the supply chain? We helped the people out of the factories and re-educated. So by, by working with business, policymakers, and society as one, in 900 days, we produced the modern day Slavery Act, which was the last act of parliament of the last government, working in perfect tandem, and it's the fastest act ever to pass through uh, parliament in Britain. Uh, an example of where we're not working together and not thinking is the AIFM directive. It's the private equity directive of, of Europe. It's one of the most foolhardy, ill-thought-through, incompetent pieces of legislation ever thought up. It was written for the hedge fund industry, but because the European parliamentarians in Strasbourg thought that private equity and venture capital were a bit like hedge funds, but maybe worse, Anyway, we all came under the umbrella of alternative. Yeah, yeah. They thought as this directive begins with an A and it's an alternative directive for hedge funds, they thought let's put in real estate and private equity and venture capital as well. And I led the policy uh, makers in Paris with ESMA in a team uh, with 27 European regulators. It took one and a half years to amend it into something that's just about workable. And it really has set European venture capital back a long way. And it's an extremely sad piece of work. We've probably lost 200,000 jobs. If you look at unemployment in Southern Europe for those aged 18 to 28, on average uh, 20, 20 to 25% in most countries, you can blame things like that directive because policymakers are trying to hold people to account without understanding what they do. So uh, in terms of economies, uh, we have a basic idea, a springboard economy and a springboard society. These two, I'll go back to the first one and the next one. If you, what I'm encouraging governments at the moment is to support entrepreneurship, to support not just the most brilliant in every society, but the weakest and the poorest. So, springboard economy with a springboard society. And there are 12 points here, and they're broadly the same 12 points. If I look at the work I've done in South Africa, Mauritius, Saudi Arabia, the EU, and in Britain, these are the 12 points that govern me. And I'm particularly proud of the society one. Because if you 
think about what I said earlier, that we're going to have a few hundred million, possibly a billion people in the middle age group, 20 to 30, without meaningful work because of technology, robotics, how artificial intelligence will affect everything, but the great bulge of population growth is coming through and then it'll go, we're facing a very significant social upheaval over the next 25 years. And it's these principles that would allow us to bring those people into our world. And the most important one of all are the bottom two. Business must step up to share responsibility and engage with the weakest around it. And then you will be appreciated, regulated in an appropriate way. So for every business person planning their future thinking, be inclusive, be kind, and be thoughtful about those who are the least well off. So the three big megatrends I'll just leave you with are these three. The giant exponential change in technology, the work of Frode Odegaard, what I said earlier about jobs, firms, and industries, extreme impact on the future, the quality of work. Secondly, the extreme change in population patterns, let's get it right, let's go beyond the UN work. And thirdly, the job displacement that will come from both, and therefore the role of business. And here are my four basic principles to conclude on, which uh, I can make these slides available so you can read that later. Thank you very much, everyone.